It's not. Welcome back to Director's Choice. Not all superheroes wear capes. Some also wear expensive suits, drive custom-made and named cars, and have an entire headquarters of operations all to themselves. If our intro hasn't clued you in, that's all right. Our subject for this video lives a double life, after all, so it can be easy to mix up the playboy billionaire with the vigilante superhero. Or can it? Well, let's see how Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, plays it out in his life. Things fall. Things on Earth. And what falls is fall. In this episode of Director's Choice, we are going to be taking night vision spectacles in a close-up look at the life, adventures, mishaps, and the whole nine yards when it comes to the story of Bruce Wayne. Rachel? I heard you were back. What are you doing? Uh, just swimming. Who was he before he became Batman? Did the reality behind his parents' death increase or decrease his passion for justice? How is his life so intertwined with the Joker? What does the loner mentality have to do with his superhero personality? With so many questions and some of the answers, let's get straight to it. Here is the breakdown of the life of Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne was born into a life that would have been picture-perfect in every way imaginable. His parents were wealthy socialites in Gotham City. Despite their abounding wealth, Dr. Thomas Wayne and his wife Martha were very charitable. Martha Wayne wanted to set up a school for the underprivileged, but this clashed with the Court of Owls, who were against progress in Gotham. Enough of this. You are the leader of the court. No one disputes that. But you absent yourself from Gotham for years at a time. Decisions had to be made. The ruling council stands by its actions. When Bruce was three years old and his mother was pregnant with her second child, the Court of Owls ordered a hit on them. It got executed in the form of a car accident, and while Martha and Bruce survived, the unborn child died. And from then, the Wayne family were consistently on the hot target list for the Court of Owls, primarily for the philanthropic activities. Thomas Wayne stood against the court. He threatened to expose us. He paid the price. After his father's death, Alfred Pennyworth arrived at Gotham City and became the new butler to the Waynes. Before all this, before Batman, he was on seven years, seven years of waiting, hoping that you wouldn't come back. When Bruce was about six or eight years old, he and his parents went on a family outing to watch The Mark of Zorro at the Monarch Theater in Gotham City. After the show, the trio made their way home but the decision to take a shortcut led to tragedy and the redefinition of Bruce Wayne's life. As they stepped into the notoriously dangerous and aptly named crime alley, Bruce, his father and his mother were confronted by a mugger, Joe Chill. At the time, the accosting was perceived as a targeted hit by the Court of Owls. Joe Chill had just been a random mugger who recognized the Waynes and thought he could make some money off rubbing them. Unfortunately for Thomas and Martha, Joe Chill got spooked off and shot them, leaving Bruce with the dead bodies of his parents. <laughs> Taken apart by grief, Bruce promised to avenge their deaths at the hands of the then unknown murderer. For the rest of Bruce Wayne's childhood, he was under the guidance of Dr. Leslie Tompkins and Alfred Pennyworth, who made sure he didn't end up in the care of social services. Without their support in those times, Bruce's life may have fallen off the rails before he could find a personal identity, or two. I want you to tell all your friends about me. What are you? I'm Batman. A young man with all the resources he could ever want and none of the comforts he needed. Bruce Wayne was so deeply rooted in his grief that he attempted suicide, but he wasn't successful. Please don't run off again, I'm out of breath. In the moments before he would have cut himself to death, Bruce determined that he was going to live a life fighting to prevent crime and bringing criminals to justice. But it was still a long way before he could realize this solo mission. 
For a while, Bruce became unhealthily fascinated with the idea of capturing their murderer. As a young boy, he would play with toy guns and act out killing the man who had murdered them. Alfred, his primary caretaker, noticed this and decided to send Bruce to an upstate rehabilitation home in Arkham. His time there helped Bruce to make some friends and find a logical way to cope with life, but the post-traumatic stress was still present. You taught me the world only makes sense if you force it to. Shortly after his time at the rehabilitation home, while Bruce was attending Gotham Academy, he got triggered by a professor's question relating to a projectile fired at a target. The search for a deeper meaning to his parents' deaths led Bruce Wayne to an empty answer and a larger purpose. You're a part of this too. How am I part of this? You'll see. Bruce Wayne started traveling the world in search of something to give his life some meaning, learning that his parents' deaths weren't part of a grand scheme or master plan over and over again left a gaping hole in his vengeance plan. He needed to redirect those feelings into something else. So Bruce spent time across the world, picking up intellectual skills and physical training under extreme conditions. His new mission was to ensure that the world was rid of any type of evil, similar to the one that led to his parents' death. On his global journeys, Bruce Wayne's first stop was at Tibet to learn martial arts and sword fighting from the Shaolin monks. What are you seeking? Don Miguel, a Brazilian criminal, taught Bruce how to race cars, and he got his stealth training from a master at the Hida Mountains of Japan. Over the years that he spent abroad, Bruce studied technological gadgetry, criminal psychology, and forensics. He endured grueling training from nomads and trained in martial arts with Chu Ching Li and Tsunetomo. I don't remember. Like these brass subs. They are dying. To know. Life in every breath, every cup of tea. Bruce Wayne trained under Henri Ducard in Paris, but he soon left after finding out that Henri killed the people that he hunted as targets, which Bruce didn't agree with based on principle. Almost seven years after his disappearance from Gotham City, Bruce Wayne returned at the age of 25, and after an eye-opening first night out as a vigilante, Batman was born. Have you told anyone I'm coming back? Oh, I just couldn't figure the legal ramifications of bringing you back from the dead. Dead? You've been gone seven years. You have me declared dead. Well, actually, it was Mr. Earl. He's taking the company public. From his years of training, Bruce Wayne had become a living weapon, though without supernatural powers, as he was well on his way to becoming a vigilante. On his first attempt at being a hero, he wore casual clothes and barely survived. Returning to his study at the Wayne Manor, Bruce decided to reassess the situation, and he knew that being a vigilante to protect the innocent meant that he had to create fear in the criminals. Planetary engineering modifying the Earth's atmosphere and topography. He designed the costume, collected his weapons, and established his headquarters, which was located beneath the Wayne Manor mansion, known as the Batcave. From there, he began to stalk criminals at night and protect the citizens of Gotham City as the Dark Knight and Cape Crusader. For a very long time, the only person who knew about his dual personalities was his butler and former guardian, Alfred Pennyworth. After all, the Wayne. Sounds like a recipe for disaster. Bruce Wayne as Batman began to spread terror among the criminals of Gotham's underworld, and this led him to fight off some of the worst villains in comic book history, including, of course, the Clown Prince, aka the Joker. Speaking of which, you know how I got these scars? No, but I know how you got these. <laughs> Bruce Wayne's entire identity as Batman is sustained by his numerous adventures and acts of heroism. But those challenges wouldn't have been possible without the evil in the world, which Batman had to fight off, sometimes repeatedly. Throughout his lifetime as Batman, Bruce Wayne has had to deal with several villains, and some of them have become his arch enemies. Ladies, gentlemen, you've eaten well. You've eaten Gotham's wealth, its spirit. But your feast is nearly over. From this moment on, none of you are safe. Batman has had to deal with Two-Face, also known as Harvey Dent, the Court of Owls, for obvious reasons, Talia al Ghul, the nightmare-inducing Scarecrow, Edward Nigma the Riddler, and Bane, one of the strongest villains. <laughs> 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 
base has cost to your strength. Victory has defeated you. The most iconic villain in all of Batman comics, animation, and live action history remains the Joker, who is the perfect parallel to Bruce Wayne. Batman wants to bring peace and calm to the world, but Joker wants to spread chaos and disaster, and he gets a kick out of leaving a trail of destruction for Batman to handle. From the very first issue of the Batman comics, the Joker has been a staple in his life, and he is one of the few characters that continue to reappear. The Joker's psychotic nature, in direct comparison to Batman's controlled behavior, make him the worst and best arch enemy, and a defining character in Bruce Wayne's life. As he fought off enemies and protected Gotham City, Bruce Wayne didn't just make enemies though, he also had allies. You see, I believe enemies are coming. Stop right there. I'm in. You are? Yeah, I, I need friends. Bruce Wayne's, aka Batman's closest allies are members of the Justice League, which he formed, and individuals from his early life, like Alfred Pennyworth. Alfred! Oh, the front page is up. Didn't expect you to brave the light of day for a couple more hours. Nice to be. The Justice League, a group that you should know or have heard about if you aren't living under a rock like Patrick, are a team of superheroes who want a common goal, peace and justice. The original Justice League team consists of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman and the Martian Manhunter, but they aren't Bruce Wayne's only iconic allies. The Resistance might be able to use you, but you're going to have to prove we can trust you. Are you kidding? You've known us for years. Like most superheroes, Batman has a sidekick character known as Robin. Bruce met the first Robin, Richard Dick Grayson, after the young man's parents died from a freak accident. Bruce adopted him and slowly trained him to be fit enough as a sidekick. Every day, you have to keep your center, Damien. You can't fight crime by becoming a criminal. From now on, stay close. Over the years, Batman has had about 10 different Robin characters, including female sidekicks. The Robins sometimes come up after changes in responsibility that occur when Bruce Wayne is away from Gotham on a mission, or when he dies, before resurrecting of course. Bruce Wayne had life set up as the heir to a wealthy empire, but one evening out in the wrong place at the wrong time took the dream away. He still grew up as the heir of that empire, but Bruce Wayne's life mission had changed. These past weeks, you know how much I've thought about Ra's al Ghul? About my parents? Not at all, Alfred. All you're offering me is pain. Becoming the Dark Knight and Cape Crusader was the one thing that helped Bruce handle the grief and sinking depression of his new reality. And if his gallery of villains is anything to go by, Bruce has been doing excellently in his new path. That's all for today. Thank you for joining us on the breakdown of the life of Bruce Wayne. Take a look at this other recent clip by Director's Choice and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of our latest videos.